All right, you, you are able to see my screen? If not, let me know, you can raise the hand. Okay, so in the Singapore context, uh, we call this as IDD, the Digital Engineering Transformation, we call this IDD. So what is IDD? Let's take a look at IDD. And IDD affects the entire project, right from the owner or the developer all the way to the contractors, consultants, and including building operators. So what is IDD? IDD stands for Integrated Digital Delivery. It's an acronym used in Singapore. And uh, it looks at integration. So integration is the main word here for integrating all the project processes and the stakeholders. So there are many different project processes right from the beginning of the project or inception to completion and beyond. These processes are sometimes are in silos. So IDD looks at what is the best way to integrate them. So I'm going to talk about these processes and procedures. And this is a part of the construction industry transformation map from the Singapore government. The Building Construction Authority of Singapore have uh, initiated the IDD to be deployed in building industry. So as a part of the industry transformation map, the key trust areas were green building, then DFMA, that is designed for manufacturing assembly. And the last one is the integrated digital delivery, which I'll be touching upon today. Um, needless to say, IDD requires BIM and VDC. It stands or it builds on top of BIM and VDC. So what is BIM? What is VDC? What are all these acronyms? We will see in a minute. Okay, what is BIM? I think for those of you who may be wondering or who may not have come across, building information modeling is the BIM, which is a 3D digital representation of the physical and functional characteristics of a building or a facility. So, which means that when we construct any project, we do it twice. So once in the digital world to make sure that everything fits properly, and then in the real world at site. So when I say in the digital world, uh, the different stakeholders like the architect, the structure engineer, the MEP engineer, the fabricator and so on and so forth, they need to uh, first design a part of their idea and then produce a BIM model, bring all these BIM models together, what we call as a federated BIM model, to make sure that there are no clashes or design issues before the construction starts to happen at site. So this is also a part of the IDD. So I'll be talking about that in a greater detail. So why do we need IDD? What, what is the Singapore government's initiative aiming at? As you can see from the picture, the two pictures talks a thousand words, the construction industry is still quite manual process uh, with a lot of workers required at site compared to a automobile industry or a manufacturing industry, which are now um, automated or which are now highly uh, digitized. So the IDD tries to simulate that in the construction industry. That means we make all the building components in a factory, bring it to the site, erect it at the site like a Lego block, and this will reduce the number of workers. It will increase the quality. It will increase the, you know, the construction time and so on. So let's look at what involves in IDD. Uh, for easy understanding, the IDD has been uh, you know, categorized into four pillars digital design, digital manufacturing, or digital fabrication. It's also called as digital fabrication, digital construction, and finally, digital asset management. So in my talk now, in the next few slides, I will be touching upon each of these four pillars, and I will be giving some use cases and some example. It's not possible due to the time available to talk about everything, but it will give you certainly an idea of what is IDD and how IDD can be deployed. So we must also make sure that after we decide to deploy or implement IDD in our project, we must have some KPIs, uh, some objectives we must set at, at the beginning. Uh, basically, these involve something on cost, time, quality, safety, and productivity. 
Of course, we want to reduce cost, make sure that we complete the building faster and the quality should be very good. And of course, there should be zero accidents or zero fatalities at the site and so on and so forth. Okay, to implement IDD in any built environment project, uh, or whether it's a building or an infrastructure projects, you need to first ask yourself, what is your goals and objectives? Uh, what are you going to achieve at the end of the day? Then who will do it? I mean, do you have the capabilities? Do you know how to do it? Or do you need to get external help or a third party help? Then when you want to start doing it now or progressively, maybe one at a time in the next coming years or months, then of course, in order to implement IDD, you will require some hardware, software, technology, and eventually training. This also you need to understand that it's a part of IDD deployment. And all this comes with a cost. So you need to set up an IDD budget. It's also very important. Once you decide something that you have planned this, you, this is your achievement, and then this is the money you have set it up, then you need to measure the success of your implementation. That means you need to monitor whether you achieved your goals and objectives. So most important is in any organization, whether he's a contractor or a consultant or even a developer, the buy-in from the management is very important because once it comes top down, it is very easy to implement. If people at the top are not convinced that IDD will bring them benefits, then it becomes a bit difficult to deploy or implement IDD in your projects. So now I said that we will talk in a greater detail about the four pillars of IDD. We begin with the first one, which is digital design. Uh, normally this pertains to the designer or the architect who will be designing or coming out with a design for the building or infrastructure. So one of the, uh, one of the aspects of digital design is to help the architect or the digital or the designer to find some digital tools so that he can design much faster. So we call this as um, parametric design. That means some numbers drive the form. You can see the picture here. There is this uh, visual program, which is from a software called Rhinoceros and Grasshopper. By just changing or tweaking the handles here, you can get different forms of the building. So the architect or the designer will be able to play around and even he can ask the computer to come out with most optimum uh, types or uh, most optimum options for a given set of parameters and the computer is able to do. The next option is not only automation, we are also talking of optimization. That means the design is already there, but it is not optimized. Like in this example, my architect here is trying to build a facade, which is not a box, but it is of some organic shape. And we want some paneling to be done uh, to install glass and aluminum frame. So it's very tedious and almost impossible to do this manually. So we use computer programs to come out by optimizing the paneling and the number of uh, glass pieces required to come out with this kind of a shape and so on. In Surbana Jurong, from where I come from, we use um, computational design or we use computers to help our designers to come out with optimal layouts. In this example, we have a HDB precinct where we want to lay out the blocks. Then we use uh, tools like Galapagos, which are like an AI tool to come out with the optimum layout based on certain criteria. Where is the view? What should be the minimum distance between two blocks? What is the, the, uh, the fire escape running distance and so on and so forth. So in addition to the design tools, the digital design offers a great deal of visualization tools like augmented reality and virtual reality. So we use this internally and also to tell the client because the client can immediately understand the intent of the architect. So we have this system called CAVE in which images are projected on five surfaces of a room, like here on the right hand side, and you can walk in and you feel as though you're inside the design. 
the inside the model, the 3D model. And this is called experiential. We experience these spaces instead of seeing on a flat monitor or on a screen. Okay, the next part of the digital design is virtual design and construction, VDC. It means that once the design has been finished before the construction starts, we need to make sure that there are no issues, there are no clashes, there are no, uh, what do you call, discrepancies between different disciplines, architectural, structural, mechanical, uh, interior design, landscape, et cetera, et cetera. So another uh, use case would be to use uh, computer tools to do code checking. Uh, code checking for authority submission is a great deal of time consuming uh, activity. So by using computer programs, we can minimize the time spent on code checking. And of course, quality checking. So when the designer produces a drawing or a design or a model, we can use automated uh, uh, code checking or automated quality checking programs like the one here shown on your left-hand side to run on a model to make sure that the model is properly built and correctly built. So as a part of standardization in Singapore, the BCA have come out with something called as a common data environment data standards. So when you construct a BIM model, what are the minimum information you need to capture inside this particular BIM model? And it is also a, a subset of the international information, in, international standard called ISO 19650. Uh, which is for information management. How do you manage the information you produce at different phases of a project, of a design and a construction project? So now I jump to the second part of the IDD pillar, which is called digital fabrication. So, so far we saw digital design, which is the domain of the consultant, mainly the consultants. The digital fabrication, is a process where we use machines or automated methods to speed up construction. For example, prefabrication. So you can see here in the illustration that the, some of these HDB apartments now being constructed is throughout Singapore. We make uh, something called as a PPVC, prefabricated pre-finished volumetric construction. For example, a toilet can be completely finished with all the internal fixtures, fittings, finishes, Etc. brought to the site, lifted by a crane and put on one top of another, which will speed up the construction because irrespective of the weather and the, um, the availability of time, in factory things can be made 24 by seven. So this will be very, very efficient way of construction. Going one step further and taking the same concept, we have this thing called DFMA, which we inherit from the uh, automobile industry, for example. In automobile industry, different parts of cars are made elsewhere. They are brought to an assembly line, and in the assembly line, they use automated process like robots to assemble a car or 100 cars in one hour and so on. So here, we try to emulate that in a way wherein we can construct a different volumetric, like a room, like a living room, bedroom, etc in the factory, bring it to the site, lift it up like a Lego block and put it together. In fact, this is one of the examples which has already been constructed in Singapore very recently by using lightweight materials, not only concrete. So it is not just limited to, DFMA is not limited to just structure and architecture. We can even think of MEP, mechanical, electrical and plumbing. Uh, for example, here in the picture on the right-hand side, you can see that the pipes, the cable trays, the pumps, and all those equipments can be made in a modular kind of a unit, like six meter long, and they can be brought to the site and hoisted uh, to the roof or to the basement where they need to be present. So DFMA is also can be used in MEP. Uh, going further, we can think of robotics in construction, like if, the, if we have welding, a lot of welding involved uh, in a construction project like bridges and, and any other infrastructure projects, then we can use the robots 
which can read our drawings and our model directly and fabricate for us, just like the car manufacturing industry. So the, this poster comes from the BCA, which talks about the advantages of DFMA, reduced cost, reduced schedule, because everything is made in a controlled environment in a factory, improved site safety because of less number of workers, reduced waste. This is also very important because we are talking about green, green building. We don't want to produce waste. We have to minimize as much as possible. Higher productivity, naturally, because everything is in a controlled environment, improved environmental performance, higher quality. And uh, we can also think of deconstruction. That means if we make in the factory, we can make in such a modular way that after its life span, we can deconstruct the building and ship it to somewhere else if we want to. So we talked about now two pillars, the digital design and the digital fabrication. Now let's jump on some of the use cases in digital construction. So what are the IDD processes in digital construction? Yeah, when the construction happens, or even if it before it happens, the contractor must make sure that all his subcontractors who are supplying or who are uh, constructing different parts of the building, like the, the electrical subcontractor, the plumbing subcontractor, or the HVAC, heating, ventilation, air conditioning subcontractor, they all make different models based on the design intent given by the main consultant or the lead consultant. And the contractor must also do a similar VDC process like what the consultant would do during the design stage. We call them as ICE session, integrated concurrent engineering, where all the stakeholders sit in a big room environment like this or here, you can see. And using the BIM model as the reference, they sort out all the issues which may be a construction issue, which may be a design issue, or maybe the contractor want to come out with another alternative and so on and so forth. So VDC process is a very important process in the IDD implementation. So if you are saying that I want to implement IDD in my project, you have to think of two things first, BIM and VDC. These are the foundations for IDD. All right. So let me just go quickly now in the help of, uh, in the interest of the time, I have about five minutes. Um, we can think of using RFID technology to, to manage and monitor pre-constructed uh, pre or uh, uh, in components which comes from the factory. We can even do a live tracking, which means we can have digital fence or a geo fence and track the people, track the machinery. We can use drones. Drones are also part of the IDD for site progress tracking or even site monitoring and so on. And smart installation using different kinds of sensors can talk to each other like in the crane here so that there are no accidents at site and so on. Site safety, of course, is an important part of the construction activity and uh, the IDD processes like uh, simulations of how I carry a particular component from one floor to another floor should be taken care of. So last but not the least is the digital asset management. And in the dig digital asset management, uh, after the building has been constructed and handed over, we need to look at defect management for which you can go to the site, take pictures, come back and compare with your BIM model to see whether there is any discrepancy or using a new technology called as LIDAR scanning or a laser scanning, you can scan the space and superimpose the model on top of your BIM model to see the discrepancy, whether the contractor has constructed correctly or there is a shift in the components or inaccuracy and so on and so forth. Currently, we are also exploring in Singapore to use robotic inspections. The, these robots can travel from floor to floor and take photographs and check for defects in the construction. And of course, where you cannot access physically, we will be using uh, drones to capture, to photograph or take video and so on. Then once the building has been handed over to the owner or to the developer, he will have to maintain this until the end of its life cycle. It could be 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, depends. So we can use a 
FM system, a facility management software to track whether building equipment is functioning properly or functioning optimally by using sensors and so on. This is also a part of uh, the IDD, the integrated digital delivery. So in case of uh, command center where you can see the television, see the video uh, streams from different uh, spaces or uh, you, you can get some inputs from uh, pumps or lifts or any equipment which requires maintenance or which is going to go out of order soon and so on and so forth. So this is an example of a, a maintainable asset. As you can see here, the person can go take a small uh, tablet or even his handphone. He can scan the equipment. He will get all the information of the equipment and then he can locate that equipment where it is and how it is connected. Maybe there is a leak in the building and he wants to stop the leak. He can trace it everything in his pocket. Uh, it's uh, digital technologies on the fly. And this is, uh, there are a lot of these kind of systems available in Surbana Jurong. We have our own system. We call it as Omni. All right, so this is my final slide. In conclusion, IDD is integration of processes and stakeholders. So processes means design process, um, collaboration, coordination, construction, inspection, all of them are different processes. Stakeholders are the people involved in the project, clients, contractors, subcontractors, consultants, subconsultants, uh, building operators. So we want to integrate them using a centralized platform, what we called as the, the central, the CDE, the common data environment. The IDD spans across the entire life cycle. So IDD is not something at the design stage and you forget it. It is, goes across the entire life cycle until the building is demolished. IDD is a government initiative to digitalize the built environment industry, especially here in Singapore. Uh, the government is promoting and pushing very hard for all the stakeholders in a project to digitalize as much as possible. IDD is a set of defined processes. It's not any equipment, hardware or software. It's a process which may require some additional hardware or software. IDD can be progressively implemented in the built environment industry. That means you don't have to do everything in one shot. So as I was saying, the four pillars, you can start from pillar one, then progressively go to two, three, and four, and so on. So that's about my presentation. Thank you very much for your patience. Hi, thank you, Chandra. So from IDD now, we would like to invite our next speaker, uh, Mr. Shankar, Digital Services and Product Leader, East Asia Arab, Hong Kong. And he will be presenting to us demystify artificial intelligence to fire up aspirations of built environment. Over to you. Thank you so much. And, uh, and good afternoon, everybody. I would like to share my screen now. I believe um, everybody can see my slides. Right. Okay. So um, I just wanted to give a bit of introduction about, you know, the general uh, differences from construction industry and, and also the technology industry. So before that, uh, I'm Shankar, I'm based out of Hong Kong. Uh, I lead the digital services and products for Arab in, in East Asia. Uh, and what it means basically is how do we apply technology to bring in tangible transformation? Because the transformation could be a buzzword that doesn't land. Uh, and to us is what, what is going to be landing and how is it going to make a differentiation to the actual deliverable that we do? And specifically, my focus in the last year and a half has been on artificial intelligence. Uh, so today, I thought um, I could share a little bit about the practical uh, stuff of artificial intelligence. Um, and so, let me start with this: that you know, that the first slide, the cup, the curiosity doesn't actually kill the cats. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you why and how is that. Right. Um, we always, uh, you know, say that the curiosity is the mother of all inventions but built environment is very unique. Uh, we don't accept anything that has not been tried in the, you know, any other projects for the next uh, last three years or four years or whatever. Um, so, and that is going to be kind of a fundamental differences for us in terms of the cultural differences and the expectations from a technology industry 
to a construction industry. You know, um, this is the old proverb, haste makes waste, uh, but in, in, a, in, a, in a technological industry, in at least in 2020s, we always talk about, you know, making fail fast and, you know, acting small and making sure that you learn quickly and rapidly. Uh, and there's a very big differences between the way a detailed design, a concept design, and, and going through lots of approval. It's a bit of more waterfall approach, whereas the agile approach in a, in a technology industry. And innovation is a team sport. We always keep talking about it, uh, but then, then our you know, convention methodology is like too many cooks spoil the broth. Um, and so what we talk about innovation is that it's not going to come with the magical uh, you know, legend of only a super smart engineer or super smart software engineer. We need everything. The domain and the technology need to come together. And then that is where it's a collective game and it's a, it's a team sport. It's not about who's more important than the other, uh, which is very different way of doing things in, in the modern technology world. And now the challenge or the premise that we have is construction is a 5,000 year old plus industry. Uh, and we still have examples of that standing in here. What it means basically is uh, it's a wisdom that's been you know, iterated and reiterated uh, and fine-tuned, standardized, and it's rigid, which means that you know, even to the extent that the design codes are super strict in every individual country or in a region. So we have to simply follow that. There is no option. Uh, it's, it's not really a guideline. It's absolutely a standard that we need to follow with. So when the industry is really that rigid, it has its advantages. It also has its disadvantages. So, and this is where, when we compare uh, you know, the industry, you can see that the, the EBIT, the earnings before, it's only about 5%. That's really, really small. We may talk about trillions of dollars of industry, but the profit margin is very, very thin. What it means is that all that it needs is like one mistake, and, and that can actually take away this profit margin for any contractor. And this also leads to us in this industry, which is mostly outsourced. A lot of outsourcing happens because no one individual company can have those thousands of specialists that we may need. Uh, and they don't want to have like everybody bulked around one company because you, the construction, the, the uh, business cycle is always going to be ups and downs. So, and this is where, you know, the companies have lots of partners, lots of specialist partners. It's, it's more than the IT world. And which means that there's a lot more legal issues in construction industry than any other industry. Uh, and this is also going to be a problem because as we are outsourcing, you know, sub and sub and sub, there is a lot of, uh, you know, elements that are always going to be gray area. And to add all these things, this industry is, uh, is probably by far uh, much more an old industry uh, in the sense that 41% of the people are almost close to retirement by 2031. And just in Hong Kong, 23% of the current workforce in construction industry is more than 60 years old. Uh, I'm not sure how far it is in Singapore. I would be surprised if it is not uh, something similar to this. So this is an industry where the median difference between the age is almost nine years now in Hong Kong. And globally, it's almost seven to eight years. What it means is the knowledge gap is almost nine years. What used to be only six years before, maybe 10 years before, has become nine years now. The knowledge transfer is not going to happen. It's all in the mind of the experts. It's not actually being transferred to the next generation. So, and this is where the technology is not anymore an option or a choice, but it's mandatory for this industry. Whereas compared to this, the technology industry is only 70 years old. Um, you know, the two of the, the, the master people, Ed Catmull as the, the founder of Pixel Networks, on the left is actually somebody who actually, you know, founded the, the first 3D print, uh, printing itself and pixels itself. So this is only a very small industry, yet it actually grew super fast because we invented something called copy and paste, adaptable, adopt, adopt, adopt. That's something that the technology industry has done it much more better than any other industry in the world. So with that background, uh, we actually take up an agile culture. We, we don't want to be perfect before we go to the production. We probably will release something in production and try it on the production side, which will never happen in a construction site. And for good reasons, just because the construction industry has a lot more liability and legal responsibility, and we are talking about lives of the peoples, so they need to be much more careful. So there is always a difference between technology and construction industry itself. So with that, um, I wrote an article uh, probably a year and a half ago uh, about construction industry that it's a story of rabbit and tortoise. Uh, I feel that construction industry is more like a tortoise. It's a protected industry with a shell of lots of rules and regulations, uh, and it assumes that the technology 
a rabbit, it's not going to disrupt it, but it's actually happening. If you actually look into the, the investment from the venture capitalists in the last two years, it has increased by 400%. What they're trying to do is the technology sees the construction industry as a bit more, you know, having a lot more inefficiencies. Uh, it is a bit more too rigid and they think that there's an opportunity for them to completely disrupt it. So the sooner the construction industry is actually going to look into it, the better. Otherwise, it's going to be some other software company hiring, you know, uh, acquiring a lot more construction industries in short time. So with that, uh, and this is how I feel because the tortoise uh, things changes the race of the game because originally they called tortoise slept, but nowadays there's more and more rules and regulations which makes the river where the technology companies cannot swim. And, and so this is where the challenge between the two industries are going to come into place. With those background, let me talk about a little bit about AI. Um, AI, why I'm talking about AI and, and what actually is happening in the AI world. Uh, AI is the new uh, buzzword in the technology industries. Um, you know, if you have a startup and you say you're a dot AI company, suddenly your valuation becomes billions of dollars. Uh, what used to be an IoT 10, 15 years ago, uh, everybody used to call themselves dot IO and suddenly it become a billion dollar company valuation. But in reality, how much of that is buzz and hype and how much of that is reality and what is the real value that they bring into the, the industry? So um, what I've been doing within Arab in the last one and a half year is basically setting up an AI program uh, to our engineers from multiple disciplines. We, we bring them together and we try to give them a use case that's practical from the built environment that could be solved by data, that can be solved by data-driven you know, uh, technologies and analysis and how artificial intelligence can actually bring them in and solve those problems. So we had our first season, we named us Alpha, uh, and I'll show you some of the use cases of what examples we actually try to solve in using AI. And right now we are doing the second season, which is beta, and we are hoping that we will have the next season next year uh, as gamma. And, and what it primarily means that bring in domain experts, making them collaborate and helping them with the AI programmer, embed them with the AI programming expertise to solve a problem together. And this is exactly what I meant by it's a team sport. You need all the skills together rather than just only one kind of skills there. It's not all about the domain expertise and it's not all about the software programming itself. Uh, they need to come together to solve a, a problem statement. So this is, these are the building blocks of AI. I mean, you're talking about the insights as the, at the topmost layer, the crown jewel, the insights. But actually, the, before we talk about insights, uh, in my personal experience, it's all about framing the right problem statement. If you do not have a right problem statement, uh, you are trying to solve the you know, wrong problem, which may not be beneficial or helpful. So in a building block, uh, before we talk about you know, any ML model or AI, we need to always evaluate the problem statement of what is the problem statement that we are trying to solve and whether this problem statement is valuable uh, in terms of efficiency or in terms of criticality or strategic. And that problem statement, when we talk about, do you have the right kind of data sets? And can you, do you think that we can actually collect these data sets in an unbiased way? And that is when we can have an insight. So these are the building blocks of any, any AI. And a lot of times, if you talk to uh, you know, AI companies, whether these are big companies or small companies, uh, a very general answer is that is AI and I can't explain it because it's AI. And when somebody tells you that, probably they don't understand or they actually know, have no clue about what they are trying to do uh, because AI can also be explained to a reasonable level. And, and it's just that whether people want to tell you the fact of what they are doing or not. So let's talk about this example. This is a virtual, so I'm not going to ask you this question, but if you see this slide, uh, you know, for a smart trained brain, uh, you can immediately spot out the mistakes in the slide. Uh, there are a couple of spelling mistakes on the words there. Uh, you can see that it's, a, it's about feature and extraction. They're spelled wrongly and it's intentional because quite a lot of times people will talk about machine learning as uh, I upload a lot of data and the machines can automatically come up with a silver bullet and it's a magical you know, information that can solve all my problems. It's absolutely not true because the machines do not understand your business and machines definitely do not understand your data as well. It is you, the person sitting in the chair as a domain expert need to train these machines to tell them what is this model. Uh, the machine doesn't understand that the cat can be a gray color, white color, black color, or maybe a green color in an odd way. Uh, the cat doesn't have a short tail or a long tail. These are the attributes that the individual, like human, need to train the machine so that in future, 
if an object can be identified as a cat or a dog. This is what we call as machine teaching. And most of the time in an AI, the individuals, the experts spend in the data cleansing and data training. This takes almost like 20% of your time. This is the most tedious to teach the machine about those attributes, those labels, before you can even do the analytics on them. And another example of this is basically a practical project applied in, in Africa, uh, who basically use the, the footprints of the animals, especially rhinoceros, to understand actually whether this is a male rhinoceros or it's a female rhinoceros, or it's actually a pregnant, or is it old, or is it sick? Uh, there are a lot of things that they are actually trying to understand based on the footprint because traditionally most of the, the animals, they used to put up a RFID belt or a tag around the neck, and they figured out that the RFID tag is actually affecting the normal living style of these animals. And that's why they are trying to be an unobtrusive way of using the footprints and trying to train based on the depth of the footprint of understanding how, what is the, the current health status of these animals. So this is the, what we call machine teaching example. Now, to do this kind of AI, the first and fundamental foremost, the most important thing is the data. Everybody talk about the data, but most of our organizations uh, have the same problem. We have data completely scattered. We have data completely unorganized, and we have data in like everywhere, which we don't understand. It's actually project by project, especially my experience in the construction industry that every project, they do the data, and then after that, they dump the data. They just go to the next project because the project teams sometimes or most of the times do not care about the data in the long term. Their job is to deliver the project on time and then just move on. So this is where the, the first pitfall for any AI project. We need to ensure that we have a common data. They are stored in a centralized platform and they are organized. So without this, you can't do an AI project. So I'll share a couple of uh, case studies here. The first one on the, on the left uh, on the slide is basically about a landslide prediction. So uh, we in my team here, we have developed the whole uh, landslide prediction for Hong Kong based on the data over the last 10 years of landslides that happened from 2011 to 2020. We train these models based on first, uh, we take up a small um, you know, area. Uh, if you have been to Hong Kong, Lantau is an island uh, and we actually use the Lantau Island data and landslides happen there over five years. We train a model, we get, okay, about 91% accuracy. Then we try to extend this model for the entire Hong Kong and run our algorithm to see whether it can actually uh, predict the landslide even in unknown data, unseen data. And then we are very successful. But then we wanted to extend this to the next phase to ensure that really is this model unbiased. Now we are actually collecting the data from Malaysia and put this in, in the uh, Malaysia uh, you know, data to see how our landslide prediction algorithm is performing. Now that's quite simple, but it is not as simple while we are training because there are lots of parameters like soil conditions, slope conditions, and weather conditions that you need to train. So if we just take up a hundred landslides that happen, we try to look into the attributes that actually are available during that kind of landslide scenarios. What are those parameters? What is the, the values of those parameters? And then we try to train this model. This needs labeling, data labeling, first of all, which takes a lot of time. It needs the expertise from the structural engineer, geotech engineer, uh, and civil, and of course, the, the uh, machine learning specialists come together to see what is the best model. Now, there are lots of AI models available, and, and, and people generally simplify that, oh, that's an, one AI model. It's actually not true again. Even for this Lancel prediction, we tried applying three different AI models to see which AI model can give you a best prediction over the five years time period. Because there could be always a better algorithm than the other. So you cannot simply say that this algorithm is the you know, best silver bullet for all kind of uh, problem solving. On the right hand side that you can see, it's the ocean plastics. So this is another point, uh, algorithm case study that we developed out of AI here. Uh, the pictures that you see on the right-hand side, uh, this reflects a river in Indonesia. Uh, it's a Sitaram River, and I think it's in Jakarta. And what we wanted to choose here is understand the plastic pollution that's flowing in the river. And a traditional way of doing this is, you know, sending people by the boat and the river, uh, through the river to do a survey and trying to do this kind of, you know, a manual analysis. What we actually do is we get the satellite data and we apply the satellite data and also Google Earth data and try to train the images uh, based on a 20, 10, 20 meter by 20 meter resolution grid on understanding what is actually a waste and what is not. 
because there could be a lot of things that looks like waste, but they may not be a waste. We even need to train them like what is a boat, what is maybe a big junk boat, or sometimes it could be uh, you know uh, different kind of people gathering together. So you need to train different kind of things. So why did we do this actually? The question that we are trying to answer in the landslide is basically try to create a risk susceptibility map to save the human lives. If we can have actually a risk susceptibility map on the landslide prediction, then we can actually, the governments can take policies and procedures. They don't need to inspect every area in the same way. They can have a high risk area, they can have a medium risk area, they can have a low risk area, and they can focus only on high risk area. On the right hand side, most of the, the, the you know, Southeast Asian countries, the rivers, they're polluted due to which the actual drinking water, even though there's water available, they are not drinkable. So the problem primarily is there are lots of factories uh, that actually even in Kuala Lumpur, there are factories that dump the waste into the nearby river. And so they don't know, the government will not be able to find out each and every waste uh, emitting factories. So when we use this kind of satellite based analytics, we can actually tell the government, nobody has to set your foot near uh, you know, the factories, but you know where the waste is coming from. This is more like a time series. You know where the waste are coming from, how the waste is flowing through, and use this analytics to understand that what are the land waste and where are the lands uh, factories located that actually emit this waste. Again, in this project, we need to do a lots of data. And then we got uh, data for more than two years of this reverse. We tried to plot what is waste and how these wastes are. Uh, but if, if, you, if you ask me what's accuracy here, we can get only about 60% accuracy for the second one. We did a trial project to see what will be the image analytics. So the important thing that was not available for us in the ocean plastics is the data set. Since we are using a free data set, which is almost 20 by 20 meter, it's not really high resolution. And so you know the plastic waste would not flow always in a 20 meter by 20 meter grid. So if we had a high resolution satellite data for which we had to pay money, then we'll basically be able to uh, get a higher resolution. So similar to these two things, we are also applying these kind of machine learning today in tunnel inspections and in facade inspections uh, in, in different industries. Uh, again, I will not say that we are actually an experts, but we learn, we are doing more practical stuff that we are learning than uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, other uh, companies around there. Uh, this is uh, again using satellite data, uh, applying in, in Shanghai. Uh, the AI purpose here is basically, you can't do these projects in a traditional way because the size of the data is huge. This is where we need to use the AI model to apply. So I'll probably skip through. These are some of the other research case studies where we try to apply the 2D drawings and extract from there the 3D objects, such as the doors and curves and staircases, et cetera. So we try to apply AI models and each of the AI models are very different from others. Uh, this is used for predictive maintenance in offshore wind farm. Uh, to extend the life cycle of the foundation. And these uh, models are very different because it's based on the IoT data. So what is AI good at? I will probably skip this for the, but I wanted to go through, you know, here, when you can use an AI and when you could use a traditional programming methodology. So when you have lots of rules very well defined, you don't need an AI at all. Uh, AIs are much more helpful and useful when the rules are not really very well defined the data is not predefined, the data could be changing, and you also need to have enough data set to train an AI model. Uh, AI doesn't mean that it's gonna be accurate, it is an iterative process. If you absolutely want a uh, very, very accurate, I don't think a, no AI can deliver you immediately in the first time. So that needs to be clear understanding, do you really need an AI? Uh, during the COVID time, people started saying that uh, the, the temperature detection cameras, uh, I have an AI. In reality, I don't think there is any AI. It is just purely a temperature detection and heat detection and the filtering process. This can be done by any normal software. You don't need any special AI there. Uh, so the last slide, what are the critical success criteria for, for AI projects, the data sets? You do need to differentiate the apple versus oranges. This is also important because you need to have an unbiased data set. If you feed only apples, the AI will never understand what is an orange. So that's the first point that you need to understand. You should have an unbiased data set. The second thing is taxonomy, the common data set. Uh, the same yes, or can be said in multiple ways. If you take an engineering industry, the facade reflects panel, pane, window, and, and any other way. But the AI do not understand these are same things. But if you even take like, you know, even in Singapore, you will use a different way of saying stuff. So the taxonomy need to be mapped in order for AI to be very effective. And then 
the domain expertise. Without the domain expertise, it's no software can actually do it. Uh, even if it is Google or Microsoft, or IBM, without the domain expertise, they can't solve a thing. They may have a cloud infrastructure only for computing, but they don't have the domain expertise. The domain expertise has to come from the built environment to solve those problems. And the feedback loop is important because the AI actually cannot do everything in one go. Even though AI is uh, you know, trying to solve, it's only helping to improve your efficiency. It cannot be the final responsible party. It's the engineer who actually looks into this data to ensure whether the AI outcome is true or not true. Um, there is a straight line and a curve and a circle. And like I showed you in the 2D to 3D drawing, the AI model is not same for everything. We actually use different AI model for different type of uh, you know, classifications. And finally, we use an ensemble AI technology to combine them together as like one AI model. So for a layman, it looks like one AI model. Underneath, actually, there are multiple AI models which are good in doing different things. So you have to consider all these things to, to implement an, uh, uh, an AI project. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you, Shanka, for sharing a very insightful session on artificial intelligence. Looks like we only have time for just two questions. And uh, these questions will be on AI. So what are the key skill sets required for AI projects? Right, I'll probably take that. I think, I think it needs a multiple skill set. It's not like only one. From a programming perspective, Python is actually a very important skill set. And also the general uh, misconception is that AI is uh, very expensive and proprietary. There are lots of open source stuff that you can already use it. Uh, so you don't need to go by any particular tech giant saying that uh, we have an AI and it just costs you like uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. You can just uh, do the open source way. You can save a lot of money and time. Right. I think we have another question. It's also on AI. Is there a fixed formula of living? Uh, a hiring big tech giant versus cool tech startup for successful implementation of AI. Uh, right, again, um, the, 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 the key is, first of all, the, the client need to understand the problem statement before you engage anybody, because there is always this Chinese proverb of 10 doctors. The doctor will treat you only based on what he or she knows. So nine doctors fail and the 10 doctor will actually eliminate and then give you a suggestion and that becomes an AI. So the client need to understand the business and problem statement first and make sure you have the right kind of data sets uh, before you can actually talk to the external tech giants because they don't understand your business effectively. Right, so I think we have come to the end in view of time. So thank you again, gentlemen, for your insightful sharing.